Amen. So tonight we're going to be in Revelation chapter 16. Uh, but before we get there, I'd really like to pray for a brother. Um, he's, his name is Joe, and he was kind of taken away by the paramedics this morning. At, just after the 7.30 service, he came in and he collapsed on the floor and was having heart problems, and EMT came up, and we're giving him CPR on the way out, and uh, we, we found out later that he's stable in the hospital, but still just like to offer up those prayers, shall we? So, Heavenly Father, um, we know that you are a sovereign God, and Lord, over all those times in our lives when, uh, man, this, this fragile body, man, it just starts to break down. We're just so thankful that we have a God that not only takes care of us now, but man, eternally takes care of us for that place in heaven that awaits us someday. So, Father, we just ask a blessing on our, our brother Joe. Father, we ask for, in the name of Jesus, for his physical body to be fully healed and bring him back to us. And, Father, we ask for comfort for the family, guidance for the physician, and wisdom of how to pro progress on for this next season in his life. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. So tonight, uh, chapter 16 of Revelation. And if you don't know where Revelation is, it's the last book of the Bible. And it speaks about John's vision of what we get to look forward to someday in heaven. Because God's uh, timing for the wickedness of the world, for this brokenness of the world, for the sin of this world, man, it's coming up. It's like an hourglass that's turned over, and it's coming down to those last few granules. And then, man, we have an eternity for those who put their trust in Jesus. We have an eternity to look forward to be with Jesus in heaven. Amen? Amen. So tonight, uh, last week, if you remember, um, Dwight did a great job leading us through chapter uh, 15, and commenters, uh, commentators actually called that the prelude to the final judgments of God, which we're going to be uh, going over tonight. And it, he gave you just a hint of what was about to come. So to keep things in context, let's go back to chapter 15, verse 5. Everyone there, verse 5 of chapter 15, John writes these things. He says, After these things, John looked and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. And out of the temple came the seven angels having the seven plagues clothed in pure bright linen and having their chests girded with golden bands. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. The temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no one was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. In other words, this is it. The day has come. Judgment day has come. So these seven angels carrying the seven golden bowls of God's wrath. And, and we see that number seven as what? Do you remember? The, the number for completion, correct. So it's that completion. It's the complete fulfillment of God's wrath. Soon to be poured out on those that have rejected God. That have turned away from and said, no, nope, I don't want any part of that. And instead, they chose consciously, willingly to follow the beast. Please remember a couple things before we start looking at these final judgments. Uh, first thing, you have to understand about the wrath of God. The wrath of God is reserved for those who have fully and completely rejected God's gift of salvation. It isn't for believers. How many believers do we have here? Man, that wrath is not for us, brothers and sisters, right? Woo! 
we're, we're, we got our golden ticket. We, we have Jesus in our hearts. His Holy Spirit is living in us, and we don't have anything to worry about. But man, God's wrath, it's going to be poured out on those that have rejected him. Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 that, For God did not appoint us, that is, believers, to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. See, during the tribulation, there's going to be these new believers that have come to a saving faith. And although they will not experience God's full wrath, unfortunately, many of these believers will, uh, will have to experience the effects of God's wrath poured out on the world. We're told that many of these new believers will then become martyrs. But remember number one. Remember God's wrath is reserved for those that have rejected him, not for believers. During this final end times, everyone who will be born into the world, he's been born. And God has looked into each man's and woman's heart, and he sees clearly the hearts of his children and those that he knows which are going to be faithful to him and which are going to reject him. So number one, remember that God's wrath is reserved for those who have rejected him. But number two, remember that God has also given every opportunity he can for them to repent and return and receive his mercy, his forgiveness, his love and eternal life. Like Paul told Timothy that God desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And what's the greatest evidence of God's love for us? It's Jesus. God sending his only begotten son to die on the cross for our sins. He wants us to be saved. He wants everyone to be saved. But those who reject him are now going to receive God's full wrath. Remember also, number three, that God always judges his children with complete justice and complete righteousness. That's our God is always just, always fair in his judgments. He knows the very hearts of men, and he alone is able to judge like no one else can, judge fairly and righteously. King David writes this in Psalm 89. He says, righteous and justice are are the foundations of your throne, O Lord. Steadfast love and faithfulness go before you. So those are the three things to remember, that God's wrath, wrath is reserved for those that have rejected him. God gives everyone an opportunity to receive him, and that God will always judge all men fairly. So with that intro, let's get into it. Verse 1. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go and pour out the bowls of wrath of God on the earth. So John now heard this loud voice in the throne room of heaven, most likely God's voice, right? Saying to the seven angels, Go and pour out the bowls of wrath of God on the earth. And the idea is, now is the appointed time for God to judge the unbelieving world and bring about that divine justice that only God can do. See, God has this heavenly time clock app on his phone, right? And he has it set for a specific time that it's going to go off. He knows when the wickedness of the world will reach its max, when everyone that has will accept him has accepted him. And now it's time. The clock has gone off. See, only God has a right to know when it's time to judge the world, right? Although when we're severely wronged, <laughs> when someone wrongs you or hurts you, someone runs in the back of your car or someone steals from you, we, we want God to judge them now right? We, we say, hey, 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 get them, God. You know, get, I, I want revenge. I, I, I want you to, uh, I want retribution for what they have done to me. But see, that's not the way God works. We want to be both jury and judge. But the Apostle Paul says in Romans uh, 
chapter 12, verse 19, that, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. In fact, how many of you have that one person in mind, maybe throughout your years, that has wronged you? Could be a boss. Could be a friend. That man just stabbed you in the back. Maybe it was a girlfriend or a boyfriend. Uh, man, I think of my life, and there's people that you go, why in the world did they do that? And man, it just sometimes makes you so angry. But see, there's a time when God's going to make everything right. And I think some of those people, they're growing in their maturity in the Lord, and Maybe God's going to use that later in this life to help them grow. So it gives us compassion, gives us that act of forgiveness that we need to learn. But also it reminds us to wait on God's timing. God alone is holy, like Dwight taught us last week. And we can act and react to wicked behavior out of our flesh and our anger but because God is holy, he sets a standard for us of justice and righteousness because only he knows the correct time. In the fullness of time, God sent his son, Jesus. Only God knows when the fullness of this time has come out that he's going to pour out his wrath. And that time has come now. Bowl number one, look at verse two. So, so the first, that is the first bull, went and poured, oh, the first angel. So the first angel went and poured out his bull upon the earth, and a foul, loathsome sore came upon the men who had the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. So that first bull, pretty nasty to start with. We're talking foul and loathsome sores. In Greek, that word is helkos. You might think of like an open running sore that kind of n never uh, heals. It may scab over, but then it just starts oozing again. It's like an ulcer. Uh, those that receive the mark of the beast and on their right hand or on their forehead... They broke out in these nasty, men, just disgusting and maybe even repulsive sores. And truly, this describes those that chose to blaspheme God, doesn't it? They were nasty, disgusting, even repulsive in God's eyes. They had this deep infection of sin in their lives, leading the world, man, straight to hell. And now because of their great sin, the judgment day had come. And this, this whole chapter, in fact, reminded me of the plagues that God placed on the Egyptians, demanding that his people, the Israelites, should be free. Many of these same plagues, you'll notice, that we see in this chapter, God is now going to use to judge a wicked world. Verses 3 and 4. This is the second and third bowl. It's where the sea and the waters of the world turn to blood. Verse 3. Then the second angel pulled out his, poured out his bowl on the sea, and it became blood as a dead man and every living creature in the sea died. Then the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and the springs of water, and they became blood. So the, the second and third angel empties these bowls into the seas and rivers and the waters of the world. And once again, we see the similarity between the plagues of Egypt. All drinkable water is now putrid. It's undrinkable. Quite literally, it's like the blood from a rotting corpse. It's nasty. It's smelly. 
All the fish in the area have died. In fact, in our area, have you guys ever been out swimming in Huntington Beach when there's a red tide? Any of you been out there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, red tide, I'll tell you, if you're out there surfing or even out there just on the beach, there are decaying fish and the smell is horrendous. I'll tell you that that red tide is car, caused from what's called a harmful algae called HABs. There are uh, these harmful uh, concentrations of, of, of poisonous algae, we'll just call it, the, call it that. They, they kill off the fish and they leave this strong stench of decay everywhere. All the plankton is dead. Yeah, pretty strong, right? Have you, any of you smelled that? Yeah. Yeah, been out there surfing. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's nasty. But these second and third bowl judgments, man, they're much worse. No drinkable water. Everything stinks like a rotting corpse, like, like dead animals. Flies and insac- insects are the only ones multiplying on this feast. This plague on the oceans and rivers also would cause Uh, a major shortage of food, and the oxygen in the oceans and the plant life that they would provide. So what we're talking about here is a slow countdown, really to the extinction of life on the earth. But amidst these judgments, John gives us these reminders. Look at verse 5. John writes, And I heard the angel of the waters saying, You are righteous, O Lord, the one who is and who was and who is to be, because you have judged these things, for they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink, for it is their just due. And I heard another from the altar saying, Even so, Lord God Almighty, True and righteous are your judgments. And I'll tell you, I, I, I just love these verses. John heard the angel of the waters speaking. And I'll tell you, I could, I could really relate to this passage. Any of you ever been out on a lake where it's really smooth and quiet, just listening to you and God? It's almost like God is speaking to you. How about on the ocean? Everyone, anyone ever been out on the ocean when you hear the waves crashing? Maybe on a beach night, right? Before all the crazy people get there that are coming to Sunday night service. You know, it's, it's quiet in the mornings. And man, you hear that angel of the waters just speaking to you. But I'll, I'll tell you, there's times when, I'll tell you when I was out there surfing on those waves, when you're taking a wave and you don't get quite over it, and man, it slaps you on your back. It's called going over the falls. And what happens is your board comes on back and, you sl- and it kind of almost knocks you out and you start churning with those waves. You don't know which side is up, which side is down. And I'll tell you, there were times where I felt like, Man, the angel of the waters, that God's hand just kind of reached you up and man took you to the surface so you could take another breath. Because he knows, God knows we're all knuckleheads, right? We do stupid things. And God has his angels out there protecting us during those times. And these angels of the waters, I'll tell you, uh, man, I believe they're out there looking after us during those times. Here in this passage, even though the waters of the earth have been polluted, the angel, notice, still praises God. He calls God the Holy One and declares that he is just, he is fair, and he is eternal as the one true eternal God. And God has always been holy and just, hasn't he? Holiness and justice, in fact, are part of God's character. So God will always be holy and just. See, God will never condemn the innocent, nor God will he excuse those who have been guilty. 
See, this wise angel understands fully that it is God alone is the source of all judgments. And he agrees fully with God's actions of turning the waters into blood. And he yields his authority that God has given him over the waters into God's righteous hands, knowing that as God is always holy, just, and righteous. Verse 8. The fourth bold judgment. Here, the wicked of the world, they're going to be scorched by the sun. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat, that they blasphemed the name of God, who has power over these plagues. And yet they did not repent and give him that is God glory. How foolish, huh? Remember, God's wrath, man, it's reserved for those who have rejected him. So those who are not repenting, man, they're getting judged right now. Perhaps believers during this time when the sun is burning everyone else, they're having some supernatural type of sun protection, right? While everyone else is blaspheming and cursing God and, man, getting burnt to a crisp, believers, they're not appointed to wrath. So we don't believe that God is going to be working his wrath out, scorching these men. God may provide all these believers with, say, a heavenly sunblock, an SPF 5000, (laughs) or or maybe uh, more accurately, giving them a place to hide from the sun that would scorch them. But important, look at the heart of these wicked men. Even with all these visible, painful, really, signs of God, They refuse to repent of their sinful lifestyles and give God glory. Many of us even today are praying for our friends, aren't we? We're praying for our family members that don't know the Lord yet. And just as God, man, never gave up on us, I don't know how many of you were reluctant to accept the Lord in your life that there was some sin that you didn't want to give up, same, some addiction, some alcohol, some sexual sin, maybe living with a person you shouldn't be living with. But I'll tell you, God never gave up on us, kept chasing after us. So too, we should be looking after our friends that don't know the Lord. We should never give up on them, never stop praying for them. Never stop loving them and caring for them and extending the loving hand of God to them. See, before spiritual change can take place in a person's life, his or her eyes must be opened fully. You might say, why? Because people may hear the gospel message, but they they simply don't believe. The world tells them not to believe that, man, Christianity is foolishness. And it's because sin has a way of blinding us. First, sin blinds us. Then it binds us to that sin, keeping us addicted to it. In fact, Paul tells us in his letter to the Corinthians that, but even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age, that is Satan, has blinded, who do not believe lest the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine upon them. Satan, the red dragon that we learned about a few chapters ago, is the God that is the very small g, is the God of this age. But Satan's influence, man, it's coming to a close. And God is doing everything he can to open up the eyes of these blind sinners and draw them back to him. See, sin has blinded these men that blaspheme God during this last judgment, but their sin 
has also bound them to trusting in their own sinful choices. You might even say that their pride doesn't allow them to be wrong. They've stopped becoming students. They have nothing more that they can learn but what they have self-taught themselves. That is why when we pray, man, for those that don't know Jesus, we pray asking God, man, just open their eyes, reveal their sin, and then help them to see their need for a Savior. Verse 10, the fifth bowl. Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues because of the pain. They blasphemed the God of heaven because their pains and their sores, and they did not repent of their deeds. Again, blind men, right? They did not repent of their deeds. Here the beast The beast and his followers loved this uh, moral and spiritual darkness so much that it was just like back to the time of the judges where everybody was doing what was right in their own lives. Man, if it feels good, let's do it. If it hurts someone else, well, I'm glad it's them and not me, right? Their morals consisted of doing whatever felt good, and they were spiritually blind to the things and the ways of God. In this fifth bowl judgment, man, the lights are now out. They have no way of getting around without any light to light their way. Perhaps this is because of a war, uh, maybe natural disasters, Many of these events could easily uh, destroy power plants and electrical grids. In fact, today, do you know what one of our major concerns in this world is? It's this super-powered EMP. And I'll tell you, it's real. A powerful electromagnetic pulse, do you realize, could wipe out the communication and the entire marketing network worldwide. People couldn't connect. They couldn't talk on the phones. And all the lights suddenly would be out. We would be back to the dark ages again. And even if you had taken this mark of the beast and you couldn't buy or sell goods, if this was a computer chip that was put in your neck or in your forehead or in your arm, I'll I'll tell you, it still wouldn't work. Suddenly, doctor's services would be very limited. Again, scalpels and knives, uh, no x-rays, no ultrasounds, no EKGs or patient's life support. John says that the people will be gnawing their tongues because of the pain. TV news, in fact, be silent. Businesses would fail and, and fear right? Can you imagine the fear of those days? There'd be fear in this utter darkness as the light grid goes down, as people's hearts fell because they can't see. They don't know what to do, where to get food. They don't know who's going to come in and rob them or murder them. Fear would grip their hearts. But see, this darkness, it's just a preview of the darkness that awaits all believers when they will be judged and one day eternally separated from God. We're told in this verse that the people blaspheme the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores. But these were physical pains, right? Man, what they weren't realizing is that their spiritual life, it was out of control. They had no relationship with the God of the universe, the creator, God. The prophet Jeremiah said it this way. He said, cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength whose heart departs from the Lord, for he shall be a shrub in the desert and shall not see when good comes, 
but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in the salt land, which is not inhabited. But Jeremiah continues. But he says, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord, for he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out its roots by the river, and will not fear when the heat comes, but its leaf will be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. See, there's always blessings, family, that, that follow those that are obedient to God. But to those that follow their own wicked ways, Jeremiah says they're deceitful above all things and that they're desperately sick. These people are blaspheming God because of their, again, their physical condition. But in reality, their spiritual condition is much, much worse. Look at verse 12. This is a sixth bowl judgment. Then the sixth angel pulled out, poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, coming out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of demons." performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and to the whole world to gather them to battle of that great day of God Almighty. Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and see his shame. And then they gathered them together to the place called, in Hebrew, Armageddon. So this great river, the Euphrates, is dried up to make way for the kingdoms of the east to make war with the beast against God. Now, who is the one really in charge of this beast's army? Do you guys remember? Who's in charge of the beast's army? Satan, right? The dragon, right? We remember that from chapter 13 that reads, the dragon gave the beast his power, his throne, and great authority. And they worshiped the dragon who gave the authority to the beast, and they worshiped the beast saying, who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? So question, how is drying up the great rivers, uh, the great Euphrates river, a final judgment of God? How is drying up a river a final judgment of God? Well, although this war is not going to end well for these wicked men, God is allowing them one final time to have what they desire. <laughs> it's it's kind of like my two-year-old granddaughter. Her name's Nova. She comes up to me and wants to wrestle with Grandpa, right? Come on, Grandpa, I'll wrestle you. You know, she comes up, grabs my leg. You could tell she, she wants me to get down, and so I get down, and we're wrestling. Well, it isn't much of a wrestling match, is it, right? The little two-year-old, I got her pinned, ah! Yeah, you, know, you know, hold her down pretty. It's not a wrestling match. We're, we're told that, um, you know, the armies of the beast, they're going to gather together against this battle against all mighty God. So God dries up the river Euphrates just so the other armies of the world can gather together for one last battle. We're told that the beast will also show off th these demonic powers. See, John saw these three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of dragon. Who, who is who? The dragon's who? Satan the devil, yeah, out of the mouth of the beast, which is also known as the Antichrist, okay, just feeding you that, and then out of the mouth of the false prophet, also known as the beast from the earth. We learned about those earlier. See, frogs, they were considered unclean, slimy, unholy, uh, 
kind of a perfect description, I think, of these uh, demonic threesomes, shall we call them. These signs that were performed by Satan's power were all to manipulate the leaders of the other countries to join in the war against God. And God gives them the place that this war is going to transpire, transpire, doesn't he? Look there. And they gathered them together to the place called in Hebrew Armageddon. Now, most of us have heard about the war of Armageddon, yeah? Yeah. Heard that term at least? Some of you, yeah, it means war. It simply means a hill or the Mount of Megiddo. Mount Megiddo is close to the city of Megiddo, and if and we're told that these demons are going to assemble their armies there from the east. Mount Megiddo is actually in northern Israel, and it's about 56 miles north of Jerusalem. So if you think kind of halfway between here and maybe San Diego, it's about that far away. Zechariah in chapter 14 tells us that the Lord will go out and fight against those nations, and when he fights on a day of battle. This means that there will actually be something of a war of Armageddon. You know, not just like my, my uh, granddaughter grabbing on my leg and us kind of pushing her off and having some fun on the floor, but the, we're actually told there's actually going to be a war of Armageddon. Uh, but the ending, man, the ending is going to uh, venture in the return of the second coming of Christ. So that's what we have looked forward to after that. But kind of like me wrestling with my granddaughter, it, it won't be much of a battle, will it? In fact, all the armies of this world, with all their modern technology and all their warfare, man cannot stand against our Lord God Almighty. Amen? Amen. But let's not overlook verse 15. It's maybe the most important verse in this chapter because these are the words of Jesus. Jesus here writes, Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and see his shame. See, this verse in many translations, uh, sometimes it's in red letters. Anybody have a red letter edition? Yep. Red letters, yes? Yep, yep, yep. Uh, sometimes, sometimes it's in quotation marks. Anyone quotation marks? Yep, I know I have that. Uh, so these are the words of Jesus. And this is now the third blessing that we find in the book of Revelation. And how many uh, blessings are there in the book of Revelation? Seven. <laughs> There's seven blessings in the book of Revelation. We've gone through three of them. This will be the third. The first blessing came in chapter one, where we read, Blessed is he who reads, and to those who hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. So there's a blessing, man, just in studying God's word here, in the book, specifically in the book of Revelation. Also to those, you guys, that are hearing God's word. But there's also, I think the biggest blessing comes, man, when we keep God's word. When we keep it in a place in our heart where God can pull it out and use it as he sees fit. When we, we're struggling for the words to say to our, to our kids, our boss, our neighbors. And yet, man, when God's word is kept in our heart. God will bring that out times that he can use it. And that second blessing comes in chapter 14, verse 13, where John writes, Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Write, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. See, there's a blessing here to all those that follow Jesus from now on. Because, man, we don't just have now to look forward to. We have 
an eternity in heaven to look forward to. And that's where we get truly a rest from our labors, a, left, uh, a rest from the broken bodies, a rest from the struggles and the work of life. And tonight's blessing from Jesus in verse 15 again. He writes, Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and see his shame. See, Jesus' blessing to these tribulation believers and to us tonight is to stay alert. Don't fall asleep when you're on your spiritual guard duty. Don't, don't let your defenses down, man, even for a moment. Why? Because Jesus, he's returning soon. And he's going to return both suddenly and unexpectedly. Jesus' return can catch many believers by surprise, just like a thief that breaks into your house can take a homeowner by surprise. And God not only wants us to be prepared for his return, but here Jesus tells us that there is a blessing to those who anxiously wait his return. Now, in my house, uh, I have a lot of, as some of you know, I have a lot of family in the house. I have my, my son, my daughter-in-law, and seven of my grandkids that live with me. And I'll tell you, in the bathroom, uh, there, there's no privacy because we don't believe in locked doors. See, outside, yes, we lock windows, we lock everything. But inside, if someone gets hurt, we don't want anybody locking doors. So you close the door and... Almost daily, you have people walking in on you, just boom, you're taking a shower, boom, you know, trying to do your thing. And I'll, I'll tell you, little kids, big kids, my, my kids, come on, in their 30s, still walking in without a knock. They know to knock, but that's how the surprise kind of comes. You're, you're, not, you're never prepared for it to so someone barge in when you're in the bathroom, right? Well, that being said, there's very little privacy. Uh, but see, God's blessing comes from he who watches and he who keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and see his shame. And the idea is here that you don't want Jesus suddenly returning and you not being prepared for him. Or worse yet, that you're occupied in some type of sin. So he says, stay clothed in a spiritual sense, which means uh, you need to be mindful. You need to be purposeful about your behavior every day. Remember, there's a direct blessing from God to those that are prepared and expectantly waiting for Jesus to return. And here's the last judgment. Bowl number seven, verse 17. Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, it is done. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake and such a mighty and great earthquake as, as had not occurred since men were on earth. Now the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Then every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And great hail from heaven fell upon man, each hailstone about the weight of a talent, Men blaspheme God because of the plague of the hail, since the plague was exceedingly great. So after the seventh angel poured out his bowl upon, of God's wrath into the air, meaning this final judgment of God, it's on a global scale now. It's widespread judgment on those that have finally rejected God completely. Then a loud voice declared from the temple, most likely a God again. He said, 
it is done. The work is finished. Just as Christ's work on the cross is a completed work, so also God's work of judging mankind for their wickedness, one day it will be fully completed. Those that have refused to accept Jesus as their personal Savior will now have to face the full judgment of God, the separation of the sheep from the goats like Jesus spoke of. Man, sheep here on his right, goats on his left. Notice notice there's no in-between yard there. You have sheep, the believers, and the unbelievers. John's vision now revealed sudden lightning thunder and a devastating earthquake of a magnitude that mankind, man, it's never seen before. Some commentators say that this suggests that the whole, in fact, geography of the world might be completely changed. California, you know how long they've said California's going to fall into the ocean? Well, California, along the San Andreas fault line, might really fall into the sea. Entire mountain ranges might be leveled. The the, the prophet Zechariah chapter 14 says that he predicts that when the Lord returns, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, the place from which he ascended into heaven, and the Mount of Olives will experience an earthquake. The Mount of Olives will then split in two from east to west, with a northern half and a southern half. This huge, monstrous, in fact, earthquake, man, it's going to be felt globally. Entire cities will be turned to rubble. The great city that is the great city of Jerusalem spoke of in this judgment, it's going to be split into three sections. Babylon, or those that took the mark of the beast, and chose to worship him, that is, Babylon's kingdom, will now be completely destroyed under God's judgment. The city is said to drain the cup of the wine of the fury of God's wrath, meaning God is not holding back here. God is not going to hold back his judgments. If God's holy cup were filled with wrath, God is now pouring out every last drop. The beast kingdom, Babylon, evil, wicked, flesh-driven, and godly, was charged with making the earth drunk with her sexual immorality and denial of God's authority. In verse 20, John writes, "Then, Then every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. So the earthquakes not only destroyed cities, but must have caused these huge tsunamis and geological changes. Places like, we think about Catalina, man, Hawaii, the Virgin Islands, and and Caleb, hey, Japan, bro. (laughs) I'm just saying that they're all going to be devastated. We're told they're going to vanish into the sea. And the mountain ranges mountain ranges, they're flattened. They're not found anymore. And in verse 21, John says that a great hail from heaven fell upon men, and each hailstone was the weight of a talent. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since the plague was exceedingly great. (laughs) And picture this, right, for a moment. Picture this. Hailstones, 20 inches in diameter, about, yeah, a little bit bigger than my music stand here. 20 inches in diameter, weighing over 70 pounds each, and suddenly hitting the earth at 360 miles an hour. I'd call that devastation, right? One of the heaviest hailstones in U.S. recorded history was in South Dakota, and it brought only two and a half pound hailstones. And those two and a half pound hailstones caused over six billion 
dollars of damage, and thousands of people were injured or killed. Imagine now hailstones, 70 pounds each, all falling at a rate of 360 miles an hour. There'd be worldwide panic, right? Worldwide fear, devastation. And yet, look at the passage. Nobody cried out to God for help. John tells us that men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since the plague was exceedingly great. Those that chose to follow the beast had now become so unfaithful to God that their hearts had become so hardened even to ask him for help in their time of greatest need. So the question for us to take away tonight is, man, how do we as the body of Christ remain faithful to God? Even when the world around us has become unfaithful, Because that's what was happening in these times of the tribulation. There were believers there, and they were, man, they were having to experience some of this devastation. How do we as believers remain faithful to God, even when the world around us has become so unfaithful? So, I have three things that will help us. Number one, Walk in fellowship with other believers. Proverbs 13, 20 says, He who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will be destroyed. See, we're stronger together as the body of Christ, and we learn and grow and mature best as a family, don't we? That's how we grow best. That's how it's most, it's funnest that way, right? It's a lot more fun to grow together in the body of Christ than to be a lone ranger, yeah. Number two, don't get distracted. See, this world, it can be intoxicating. There's so many choices of what to look at, what to do for fun, what to listen to on the radio, but the idea is remain sober. That is spiritually sober. Keep your eyes, your mind, and your heart focused on Jesus. Amen? And number three, like John said, stay awake. It's easy to fall asleep when you're at the wheel of a car and and you're tired, right? Any of you ever been there? Long drives, man, long day at work, and you feel that head nodding? Well, stay awake. Find your rest in Jesus. And be prepared, man, and excited for Christ's return. I I truly believe, I truly believe that Jesus is going to be returning soon. So let's not have him find us napping or sleeping on the job. But may he find us joyfully serving him wherever God has placed us. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, We just thank you so much, Lord, for your word. And we're so thankful that, Lord, no matter what this world may bring, we we know, Lord, that you have something so much greater uh, prepared for us, waiting for us, in store for us. Any wrongs that have uh, happened in our lives to us, Father, we know you're going to write those. That, man, judgment belongs to you, not to me. But, Father, help give us the patience. Help give us the courage and the perseverance that we need to walk out those faithful lives with you. Just lead us, guide us through these storms of life, Lord, sometimes. And, Father, teach us your ways. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. This has been a presentation of Refuge Calvary Chapel Huntington Beach. For more information about our ministry, please visit refugefamily.com or call 714-891-9495. Set free.